more and more. Of course, there are people who are mentally ill, there are people who are disabled, there are young people, and there are LGBT people in prisons and in jails. And you see it rising. I see it within my client base and the classes I represent getting larger and larger. The number of women in jails and prison is getting larger and larger. And so, you know, what happened often in the law is they considered them solely based upon their status or their actions. So um, if they were prisoners or criminals, there were laws built in, and especially in Michigan, carving people who, based on that status, totally out of protection. So the Michigan Civil Rights Law, the legislature passes a section that says, ah, we protect everybody under the Constitution for equal rights, except for those in prisons and jails. You have no rights under the Civil Rights Act at the moment. So if you put all uh, gay people in the solitary confinement, there's no claim for discriminatory treatment. If you decide to put all people of color in a certain prison right now, they carve them out of the civil rights protection. And so we saw that happening more and more. And, you know, allowing the abuse based on the status, the sexual assaults, the prolonged solitary confinement, and extreme sentences. And so it was the human rights framework that really saved and is saving this this area from it being worse than it could be. And so it's, you know, the concept that we started to talk about that depending on, independent of what you've done or what your status is, that as a human being you're entitled to inherent dignity and rights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the beauty of it is, is it it levels everything because there's no one who can take it away from you. Whether you go into commit a crime, whether you look this way, whether you're undocumented, no matter what you are, as long as you have, are human, so as long as you're alive, you're entitled to this status and these rights. And you can't parse it out, you can't change it, because you know that humanity is our contract, um, our social contract, that we will treat people in a certain way. And this recognition was crucial not only for the legal work we started to do, but for people on the inside to say, to come together and to say, listen, we are entitled to these rights because of our status as human. You know, we are not, we're going to resist being called um, convicts or cons or queers or, you know, the N-word or anything else because you're not going to divide us. We're all entitled to basic and inherent dignity based upon our humanity. And it did an interesting thing, too, as we went through the work. When you have a human rights framework, you have to treat those who are often the perpetrators of the abuse um, in detention, the guards um, who may be the abusers. You have to recognize that they too are entitled to treatment in, you know, with basic humanity, inherent dignity. And it allows you then to pull out and start to deal with systemic and institutional issues, which is the real problem. And so instead of creating this conflict about they're on the dark side, we're on the light side, you start to do a systemic challenge to the institution and to the way people, that the very institution itself of incarceration and detention and solitary and punishment is what is the problem. And that's what you have to attack from a human rights framework. Can we widen the circle to make sure that there's enough room for everybody? Please. Thank you. And I think that the other thing that this does is it links us to the world in a very deep way. So in just as in, in this area, and I'm using it as an example, um, there are remedies and there are treaties and there are international documents that exist that say, for example, you're a child if you're under the age of 18 and no one can take that away from you, that you're a child status. And so when you have the state of Michigan saying, well, if you're 14, 15, 16, or 17 and you commit a crime, we can treat you as an adult and we can put you in an adult prison and we're, that's where you're going to go and that we're going to somehow ignore the fact that you're still a child um, and we're going to ignore the fact that what brought you to where you're at is your very child status and that we have a responsibility to you as adults in a social system as a child. So you start to say, oh, no, you're not going to do that. They are children under the international law, and we're going to then bring that framework here in which you have to call them children. They are children, 
And the same with women, you know, women in detention, you say you, they have the right to their inherent bodily integrity and privacy and their international treaties and laws. There are the Mandela rules that deal with how you treat people who are in custody. And there's a whole framework that 149 nations have joined together and said, this is the way we are going to treat people that come in conflict with the law while still maintaining our respect for human rights. And so I think that um, one of the things I wanted to talk to is when we go into court on this and we talk about whatever group that is speaking of a human rights framework, the underpinnings of human rights is our constitution, our declaration of rights. And, you know, early on, you know, in our declaration, it talks about all people are endowed with inalienable and natural rights. This is a basic of our Declaration of Independence, and it came about with many discussions that, you know, the philosophers, you know, Hume and Rousseau and Kant were all pulled when we talked about it. They all had a concept of human rights that they were working on from various nations. And so our, our Declaration of Independence is deep imbued in that, is the concept of human rights. And it was actually the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens around the French Revolution, I won't get too deep, but that inspired our Bill of Rights so that we started to put together this whole concept of a Bill of Rights two years later. And again, within the Bill of Rights, the crucial underpinnings are human rights. And so as you go through and if you look at the history of human rights, certainly it was crucial to the um, attack on slavery the whole analysis of human rights borrowed from other countries as the U.S. was going further toward the Constitution and trying to interpret it in different ways. It was a pullback to say, no, you cannot deny people um, basic rights based upon their humanity. That's a human rights treaty. That's in our Declaration of Independence. When Roosevelt in 41 did the Four Freedoms, um, again, pulling us together and being, U.S. was a for, in the forefront of the United Nations treaties and declaration of rights in 1941, based on Roosevelt's four freedoms. And it, it fueled the fight, again, for women's rights. It fueled the fight for civil rights. Um, Reverend, you know, Martin Luther King's famous saying that it's necessary to realize we have moved from the era of civil rights to the era of human rights. Mm -hmm. Um, everyone who has grappled with some of the marginalization of people has gravitated toward the framework of human rights and found it to be an essential way of moving forward, breaking down and, uh, the, the barriers that we place between each other. You know, oh, you're this or you're that or you don't fit this framework. It's the human rights framework that can overcome all that. And I know I've talked to... Um, Joe, I got very invested in Polly Murray um, mm -hmm. about 10 years ago, went down to her home and mm -hmm. part of the center down there. I think she was the first black woman Episcopal minister, right? And I remember that she said that it was only under the banner of human rights could she be a woman, a black woman, a lesbian, and a Christian. It was only under that banner that she could bring everything together. So, which brings me to, and, and this is not a political, and I didn't intend this, but um, about, five, well, it was five years ago, on the eve of the United Nations for the first report on LGBT in Geneva, um, Hillary Clinton gave a lovely speech. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, what she did is she brought LGBT into the human rights arena for the first time. Um, really. I mean, people had worked a little bit on the edges. She had been in Beijing and said, you know, women's rights are human rights. Mm -hmm. But no one had stood up, and she did this in 2011. And I just want to quote um, a couple of things that she said, because I think she spent a great deal of time and spoke to many people before she came to this. And uh, apropos of where she is, where we are today, I think she said, she gave a long speech, but she said, now raising this issue I know is sensitive for many people, and the obstacles standing in the way of protecting the human rights of LGBT people rest on deeply held personal, political, cultural, and religious beliefs. 
So I come here before you with respect and understanding and humility, but I want to talk about the important issues we must address together to reach a global consensus that recognizes the human rights of LGBT citizens everywhere. And she talked about the heart of the matter, that some people have suggested that gay rights and human rights are separate and distinct. And she reminds people that this has been going on for a long time. People said that about indigenous people. People said it about black people. People said it about marginalized groups. And they said it about women in cultural concepts. They said, oh no, you can't have women's rights. Um, you know, you have to respect the cultural um, tenets of women having to ha have lesser rights than men or not being equal to men, um, subjected to corrective rape or um, hormone treatments or, you know, all of the things that people gave an excuse that was a cultural thing that couldn't be um, infringed upon and, and be respectful of various cultures. And the same thing was being done with regard to um, the violence against gay people around the world. And she said, we have been through this before, and every time we have come through it with a recognition that everyone has basic human rights. And when people cite religious or cultural values as a reason to violate or not protect the human rights of LGBT citizens, it is not unlike the justification offered for violent practices toward women like honor killings, widow burning, female genital mutilation, and some people defended those as a cultural tradition. But violence isn't cultural, it's criminal. Slavery was never sanctioned by God. It's an unconscionable violation of human rights, and nor is LGBT violence sanctioned by God. It's a violation of the deep, um, deep violation of human rights. And she talked about how religion and our culture are so sources of compassion toward fellow human beings. And that if we're going to move beyond the divisions here, that we have to recognize that if you're standing there and you see a person being treated contrary to their right to inherent dignity, um, that you must step forward. Um, and that the world must step forward. And that we have to recognize as basic human rights. So I think that I'm here to talk about how and to really urge that the human rights framework has a deep and guiding um, resonance in every issue when you're trying to work through these things, when you're trying to confront people who say, oh, that's against my religion or that's against my culture. No one can deny the basic rights of humanity and the discriminatory treatment and violence has no place in that framework. Is that it? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I do a quick add-on now, just related to Michigan, which is that, I mean, part of what I would love to see is our civil rights reflect mm -hmm. international human rights standards. Um, we have tried for 10 years to get Michigan civil rights laws amended. Elliot Larson. Mm -hmm. Um, to have sexual orientation and gender identity, those four words, mm -hmm. included as part of the categories around which you will not discriminate against people. Not only has that, was that blocked again last year, but now um, folks in our state are organizing for a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, mm -hmm. which would say that on the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was a national act packed to to protect the rights of religious minorities, uh, but the, it's being used by conservatives around the country to argue that on the basis of freedom of religion, uh, people should have the right to discriminate against people who are transgender, bisexual, lesbian, or gay. And, um, you know, it, it would be, you know, to think of the example, it would be as if after passing the Civil Rights Act, we then passed a law that said unless you're discriminating on the basis of race for religious reasons. And you could see how that would totally dismantle the Civil Rights Act. So that's where we are in Michigan. That's part of why. Um, and, and I guess I just also want to say in regards to, um, you know, this whole thing of moving away from arguing who gets to have civil rights. 
to a framework that says everybody uh, uh, gets to have their basic human rights. And this particularly at a time when the debate seems to be centered around whether transgender people get to have the same rights as everybody else. So once again, it's always this fight over which is the category of people we're going to allow discrimination against as opposed to this concept of religious rights. We, um, the next presentation we hope to have was young, some younger folks to talk about being the intersection of race, class, sexual orientation, gender identity here in Washtenaw County. I'm not, Jim and I put out calls for people. I'm not clear whether folks have showed up today who are going to talk about it. Um, otherwise, we can kind of pitch in and say a few things about um, the challenges for young, for youth here in Washtenaw County. Did anybody show up who was part of that call out? Okay. <laughs> so, go ahead, Carol. Can I, um, just because I've taken take notes right Yes. Now. Deborah, you you mentioned that there were going to be three pieces, and I'm not sure I got three. Can you can you just take those off one, two, three? So I think the three pieces that make it crucial. Yeah. I think that um, that the first one is that um, you know the recognition of bringing everyone together that you're entitled based upon your human rights on both sides, both mm -hmm. sides of the thing. The second thing I think, and I was trying to stay within my 10 minutes, the second thing is um, that the language of human rights is very important. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, we don't have to be as divisive as we often are with language. Mm -hmm. And it does two things, I think. It, it um, allows barriers to be broken down, um, and it allows people to not talk in terms of the status of who they are or what their um, various uh, identities are, mm -hmm. but you all come together under a human rights framework. And it also provides, you know, particularly with um, a lot of the people I work with, a sense of um, a strength. You know, it's very hard as a lawyer, you know, due process doesn't get anybody jazzed up, you know. Right. But in terms of recognizing that you know, you're entitled to these inherent dignity um, at, based upon your status as a human, or, you know, in the Flint work I'm doing, that, that water is a human right, mm -hmm. I mean, and around the world, you know, and you're entitled to this, and, and it's embedded in treaties and documents, and around the world there are 149 nations who've signed onto the water treaties. So, you know, you're not alone, and you connect with a, a broader, um, framework of people. And three, I think that it brings us back to our, it's not contrary, you know, sometimes uh, people say, well, that's an international concept, mm -hmm. and, but it's not contrary. It's very part of our deep underpinnings from our Declaration of Independence in this country and our legal frameworks. So human rights, and in fact, you know, there are many statutes that talk about the laws and treaties. Um, mm -hmm. and were intentionally built in there. And so often you have, and you know, for me it's important because in the Supreme Court, the court has in the last few years, it's um, talked about human rights and treaties and international law in, in two contexts, you know. One with regard to youth and um, uh, people in prison and two with LGBT rights. Those are the two areas, and I think they did that because we didn't have sufficient protections written down, and so they had to say, well, look at the world, I mean, you know, and, and look at our peer countries at that time, because certainly there are deep problems with regard to LGBT rights in many countries and continents. But at that time, they were looking at peer countries, and they were saying, you know, in their mind, that if you go to the basic tenets of human rights, you cannot discriminate in this way. And, in, and found within our Constitution, if you read it broadly, those rights. So the Equal Protection Clause was read broadly um, in, to make it consistent with that, because there's a fear in this country always about saying, 
oh, I'm going to follow international law or documents or treaties because then that will control us. Or I'm not going to be bound by the International Court of Justice because we're going to be independent. Right. I have a feeling of exceptionalism. if things go really, you know, awry, we're going to need it deeply yeah. <laughs> in the next thing. But it's true, American exceptionalism is deeply embedded in it. But in these areas where they saw a complete disavowal of humanity and that the language of it was they're not human or they're not entitled, and that's, you know, that grouping is particularly now, at least in this day and age, um, used with um, you know uh, the LGBT community in opposition, so they reached in and pulled that human rights framework in in the uh, in in the Supreme Court's discussion in Romer, um, in Lawrence v. Texas, um, which are the two you know two central um, gay rights cases right. that the Supreme Court has dealt with, and and so they they looked at those things, and I think that it's important that we keep it tied to our basic. Um, framework of our constitution and our rights. We don't, we just have to plow it. You know, we have to remember, we have to remember Pauli, we have to remember Martin Luther, we have to remember Stephen Douglas, we have to remember Eleanor Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt and our mm -hmm. long history of how that was a core value. So I know this would be off topic, I think, so I'd put, I'm curious about currently reading about how the United States, though, was also built upon the idea of uh, natural divine law that the white body is is superior to the black body and that, that our country was in some ways founded uh, upon the, um, uh, the white body being protected and having those rights and the black body being property. Um, so how, I would push back on that actually because yeah. I think that there was a great debate and one of the things that is not in the Constitution is that a, another human being can be a property. Mm -hmm. um, there's nowhere in there, and that was a big fight, that you're, we're not gonna allow slavery in there. And then the, the three-fourths, uh, you know, or uh, three-fifths of a man had nothing to do with that. It had to do with diminishing. You know, I mean, the southern states wanted that, of course, because um, they did not want, you know, a full count. Right. You know, well, you know they, you know, so that and and they wanted to count slaves as part of the numbers, but they didn't want to give them a full. But it, so it's in there a little bit. There's nothing in there about you know owning a proper sh property, mm -hmm. and so I think that there was a fight to keep that open. I, I think it was a deep fight. It, mm -hmm. If you look at some of the documents, what was going on, and you know, you had. Ben Franklin, and you had people coming from France, and they were they were speaking of human Locke and Rousseau, and you know we have to embody natural, you know, you know the natural rights that come from our humanity within um, these documents, and so it wasn't totally in there, but it was certainly I think a driving force, and it became, you know, and then when the United Nations was created, and and we were you know a driving force in that, and we were central to that, and we. And Eleanor Roosevelt wrote the, the mm -hmm. Human Rights Declaration. Declaration. Right, and you know, so that and the Four Freedoms, you know, are, were were pretty central to our uh, jumping off. I think that the movement has been, you know, there is actually a strong movement on this, and you know, throughout the country, um, coming from different places, there's a lot of resistance, but um, I think it's growing. The Carter Center has been a great proponent of it. There's now a whole, you know, in the last five years, it's called Bringing Human Rights Home Move Network. Um, you know, I would say that it's, you know, 3,000 lawyers strong. And then the U.S. Human Rights Network is, you know, a broad-based network that is going state to state and city to city, passing human rights ordinances in various cities, um, you know, trying to grow it from the grassroots up. Um, so, uh, you know. It's a long struggle. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Question? Yes. Um, so, in in talking about sort of the the strengths of different kinds of frameworks in approaching some of this work around equity, um, I think that one of the concerns that I've heard raised by 
um, activists and advocates who use other frameworks, especially social justice frameworks, to address equity, mm -hmm. is that there can be some concern that, um, I think, to me, one of the most beautiful things about the human rights framework is this very unifying and, in, in many ways, um, sort of provocative idea that we have so much in common um, and to, to look for the shared humanity and spirituality in each person. And that's very unifying. I think in the same way that there is some concern that um, whereas a justice framework or an equity framework looks quite a lot at differences, some would say that that is divisive, but some would say that that's protective in that although we have so much in common, there are also very important details and differences that by making space for those differences, it makes us capable of addressing them. Um, and I think, uh, let's see, a good example of that might be um, in terms of race, um, that there's some concern that um, the Black Lives Matter movement is inherently divisive because it calls out blackness and black bodies as a concern. And there have been people who responded to Black Lives Matter by saying all lives matter. Um, and so sort of a discussion of, well, of course all lives matter, but is it inherently divisive um, to call out issues around people of color and blackness? Um, it will turn some people off, but is it important to the movement? So I think that, I mean, if I for a minute and then uh, just, but I think that's a really good point. And I, you know, I think that um, all lives matter, yes, but but it's being said in a, it's always said in a, in a repressive way, at least I've always heard it in a way that says, I'm not going to listen to your distinct issues. And I think, you know, going around the world, you know, in, in, in doing human rights work, I think that distinct differences and needs and the crucial things are, are really deep in human rights. I mean, I don't think it quashes it. I don't think it needs to quash it. There are um, uh, documents. I mean, you know, every every year the com you know the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is you know particularly looks at issues and has looked at issues and been very critical on what's been going on in the United States. The Committee Against Torture. I mean, you look at particular areas and there's no, um, you know, the UN did, does their special reports on LGBT. So I, I don't think it's meant to, to suppress our differences, but it's, it requires a baseline that we are all going to, you, there will be no more the fact that some people are not entitled to basic human rights. Now, what those rights need to look like in order to get everybody to a, this, the, a higher you know, equality, I think is a vibrant and robust discussion around the world. And in fact, I often find that you know, we in this country don't have the same language. You know, you'll go to you know, having discussions uh, 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 and sir, the, uh, the racial discrimination issues and people are like, oh, you're in the U.S., you, you, you don't have the language for ethnicity, which is just as important as race and color, you don't have religion, you don't have nuances, and they get really frustrated. You know, women from India, women from, you know, very, Western Africa get very frustrated that we don't bring with us a language that's nuanced enough to have these robust discussions. So I, I think your point, I think it's very important that as a human rights movement here, that that be particularly brought up. And I think it is a constant issue that people need to be reminded of. This is not a way to say, okay, we're all, you know, we're all cool here. It's not. It's not at all. I mean, it's an important point. Uh, boy, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think so often we, 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 a horse is a horse is a horse, you know, you got to confront racism and bigotry when you, when you encounter it. And, and to be silent on the basis that, well, we're all going to be civil here, that's baloney. We've got to speak up when we see it and when we hear it. And, and you know, the person that says, well, we got to be you know, nice to everybody. Well, of course. But when there's, when there's bigotry against Muslims, when there's bigotry against black people, 
you got to identify and speak up. You know, never mind about this, oh, everybody's equal. That's so, wrong. So I wonder, um, I don't, and I'm sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I almost didn't come to this event because this is not an LGBT affirming church. That's a known, known in the community. Mm -hmm. It's been very highly um, <laughs> publicized, so I'm not. So um, I, I, I wonder, sort of, sort of two things. One is sort of, you know, we, we have this, uh, this presidential race going on. And, um, Kind of more like Saturday Night Live most of the time, but <laughs> um, I, I so we have differing views on the Constitution and whether it's uh, a living, breathing document versus the way you know that whole thing. But then I, I sort of bring it back to the the churches where some like where you just said y'all have to be like civil. Or, so some churches will say, oh, well, we love everybody, but we don't endorse this way of living. So uh, this is one of the biggest churches mm -hmm. in uh, our city. I never even, I, I used to be on the board of United Way and I didn't even know what this building was till today. But how do we address that? And I mean, you have a person who is a member of this church here in this group and I think we should, we should think about how do we, like obviously you wanted to learn about this for whatever reason or you're here. <laughs> And um, just because you go to the church doesn't mean you believe in everything that the church is espousing. That's very true. Mm -hmm. That's so, very true. yeah, it, it is. But, I, but I, I want to think about how we as people of faith, like, you know, being an Episcopalian, it's kind of mostly easy, <laughs> um, at least from the party line, you know. But it's not everywhere. And, so, and, and the Episcopal thing is only recent. Oh, so very let's, recent. Let's, absolutely. Let's not uh, pretend. Let's not pretend. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And I, I will say there are a lot of us in this church that are very committed to the Episcopal faith. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very public what happened with our church here, but that was not the only reason. So I very much support Ken and Emily for why they mm -hmm. left and things, but personally I couldn't follow them. And I think it's important that if everyone leaves, there's no one left behind to still fight the fight. fight, the fight. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so, like, I don't agree that our church is not open and affirming. But at the same time, there are many things about our church that I love, and I do love Donnell and the as my pastor. So I feel it's important that some of us stay and we saw the community because we can still talk to the people who are here and explain why we stayed, why we disagree with things, how these things happen. So, and I think when people, you know, we have to help each other in that way, you know, like. Well, as a, as a board member for ICPJ, this is also part of what we talked about when planning this event. <laughs> I bet you did. Um, you know, two minutes, in and out. You know. No, but one of the, the places of tension for me personally is um, how much do I want to identify with people that agree with me 100% um, versus the, if we only associate with people that already agree with us, we're always just preaching to the choir. Um, and I recognize that I'm saying this as a straight white ally that does not have to live out the same challenges that many other people do. But, you know, being an interfaith organization, we are trying to, that's part of what we're trying to learn about. This is one of the challenges looking into the next 50 years is how do we negotiate this issue? You know, we're, we're clearly making a stand on so many other issues, yet how do we bring LGBT equality into that conversation as well in a way that doesn't, alienate people and otherwise come to the table. I don't know how to say that any better than that. Oh, yeah. um, so that's part of why I'm glad to be in this discussion. Well, if uh, I may, uh, Pastor Joe, from, the African -American, from an African-American perspective, <laughs> I want to be clear that we don't all mm -hmm. look alike and we don't all think alike. <laughs> but uh, I did not know that this church uh, was not clearly open and affirming. Uh, until I got here, and I, and I had already driven from Lansing, and I certainly was going to stay. Well, but if I had known, I would not have come. Uh, because in, in the African American community, as an individual, I'm done with trying to convince somebody to accept me. I'm just done with that. You know, and if it is not a part of your policy, then okay, if you want to stay and make it a part of your policy, wonderful. But I'm gone. 
because it is not a fight. There are too many who do support for me to waste my time in trying to convince uh, the non-supporters. And the second issue that I have here is I don't find the building to be very accessible. So what does that say about our attitudes toward the otherly able? And, and I don't. And I think that I think that I think I would like to see us. Uh, if we really want to widen the table, if we, if we really want to put in another leaf in the table, if we really want to put more chairs around the table, then, then we should do that where the table is already set and there is a willingness to take into consideration uh, the issues that are, that, that are uh, of importance. Now, I'm not otherly able and I'm not GLBTQ. However, I, it's, it's like the other day somebody said, you know, we're going to have a dialogue. We're going to, we're going to talk about gender, gender justice, but we're not going to include the transgender community. What the hell does that mean? How do you have a dialogue about gender justice and exclude the transgender community? How do you do that? So I partly want to say, take this and use a little bit pivot here that's all related to also talk about the role of allies. Um, and and I and, and I think it needs to be part of the same conversation. I think it's a really important conversation. You know, uh, who was our last bishop, the, who whose ordination caused such tremendous? Oh, Jean Jean Robinson was the Episcopal Church's famous gay bishop, and he said it took me forty years to accept my sexual orientation, and then I was really upset when my parents couldn't accept it in a weekend. Um, and so there is a long struggle that we're engaged in in this struggle for human rights and human dignity, the recognition of human dignity. And we have folks here from Catholic denominations. Most denominations, you know, we have four or five denominations that have gotten to the place of being uh, really clearly affirming. But the rest are yet to go. And, and, but I think folks will come along when we've opened up the space for conversation. And dialogue, and, and I just want to say, here's where the role of allies becomes so critical, because uh, if you're in one of these denominations or one of these religious communities where you're going to be demeaned because of your sexuality, it becomes incumbent on allies to be speaking out, creating the space uh, to raise these questions, to make these challenges. I also just want to say, back to the human rights framework. I, you know, Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice has never taken a stand on sexuality issues, as far as I know, in the past, because of this fear of division. But I think this talk today is an example of, if we can't agree on a human rights framework, mm -hmm. there's no grounds for, for justice. I mean, I think we have to, you know, it's fine to have churches with different traditions, but we've, we've got to really press people to say, mm -hmm. we've got to come together around the human rights framework. Um, Tom. Well, I just had an observation from the legal aspect. Uh, the Catholic Church here in Michigan has recently been forced by law to offer medical uh, insurance to all its gay people. They won't, they won't even call them gay people. They got some fancy legal name for it. But the fact is, the law forced them to do that. And when, when, when Lynn and I have been working in this advocacy for over 25 years, and some of the terrible traumas, family traumas that we've witnessed, they just make you want to cry, you know? And, and my reaction to that is we need help, and we would love some help from the legal community, because I see institutional religion getting away with murder, with bigotry, they just plain bigotry, period. And they and they going to get the law to support them? No, I mean, that, that just boggles my mind. <laughs> Linda, do you want to add in on this? Well, I think what Tom's saying is very important. And I think legal support would be fantastic. I think that may be the only, not the only, but the maybe the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, maybe we can pivot a little bit and talk about a positive situation of uh, church situation, parish, Catholic parish situation, that when we talk about why you stay in a faith community that that is negative about your kids, uh, we stay because we want to change. We want to change what our church says. 
we do have an example in our own experience of, of a Catholic parish in Detroit that through um, another couple, mostly through another couple, with, with who had two gay children among their six children in that parish, they, um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they your hype <laughs> This couple and Tom and I got together and decided that we needed to make some changes in this community. The pastor happened to be very supportive. That's a big help, and I guarantee you that's what you really need. But you also need the support of the community because pastors don't want to do anything about this if they think they're going to lose money. So our pastor had faith in his community. Uh, there was there were a series of meetings to educate the faith the uh, parish about LGBTQ issues. Went on for six weeks, two months. Um, or I should say two months. It went on for probably six months. People came. They learned. They took a vote in the parish council. They voted to become an open and affirming church. They now have a big plaque on their wall. Huge plaque. It's that big, and it it, uh, it's, it says all are welcome, and it. it Details who's welcome. It's everybody. It says and, sexual orientation. And this church, this church um, was a role model for another church on the west side of, of Detroit, and they also had done the same thing in their parish. So it's catching it's us. Spread, it's step by step. It's so slow, but oh my God, when you have one success like that, you just want to jump for joy. So inclusive justice is, let me just say, a coalition of faith communities that are in all different kind of stages of this struggle, uh, but we're making progress on, on every level. I mean, the conversation is changing. And, you know, and so I miss Vineyard here was one of the first evangelical churches in the country to come out with this strong statement of welcoming to all levels of ordination people. And the result is National Vineyard passed a statement saying they couldn't do that. So saying you're out if you do this. But I still so appreciate the struggle people carried on here. And that kind of reactionary response is not the end of the story. I mean, I think we have to figure out how to carry that struggle forth. But, you know, it's going on in uh, denomination after denomination. I just want to say also, statistically, it's striking how the media has misportrayed things that the studies we have seen have the majority of African American Christians in Michigan being supportive of gay and lesbian rights, even though their church leadership is not. Mm -hmm. The majority of Catholics in Michigan are supportive of LGBTQ rights, even though their leadership is not. I mean, there's a wildly diverse, complicated conversation and struggle going on. Well, one thing, I'm, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I mean, I've, this has become a very Christian conversation. Um, and looking at inclusive justice's brochure, you also have, you know, symbols from other faiths. So, how, in your experience, have other faiths been engaging in this as well? So, I'll say quickly: most other faiths don't have the struggles Christians seem to have around this. Right. Okay. So, so Jewish communities much clearer uh, on LGBTQ issues. Buddhist, Eastern Clear religions, you know. Um, so. The Muslim community, the conversation, I would say, is still very much just beginning to open up. Um, but if you look at what the roadblocks are, who's blocking the path to civil rights for LGBTQ people in Michigan, it's significantly about conservative Christians. Um, and which is where, so again, another thing Inclusive Justice offers is workshops for conflicted Christians. <laughs> or Christians who are conservative theologically, but have a gay or lesbian friend or loved one who leaves them conflicted <laughs> about their theological things. And when workshops were done on this, in three to four hours, 60% of people moved significantly in their ideas just by having a space to talk about these issues freely, because in their denominations, there's been no space. How about... Young people, I also see some young people here. Do you want to get your voices out of this conversation, any of you? Um, you don't have to. I just, I just, I just, I just want to, just want to make sure those of us who are really comfortable talking. Back the beginning, two or three people introduced themselves as high school students. To me, that's young people. <laughs> there we go. Frank? Yeah, I, I want to say two things on the ship. Do I go or do I stay? 
issue, and they seem contradictory, but they're both true. One is you, you don't have to volunteer for abuse. Mm -hmm. if, if your church is abusing you and it's you know, putting you down, denying your dignity, then it's, then it's time to leave. The other thing is people who know LGBT people are much more likely to, um, to be more liberal in their attitudes. And I think that, you know, if everybody came out, <laughs> the whole world would be different. Because people who say, I don't know anybody who's, who's gay or lesbian, I say, oh, yes you do. You just don't know who they are. <laughs> And I believe, again, I believe the figure is something like 60% of gay and lesbian people in Michigan are not out. Yeah, yeah. So, really? you know, really? both of those things. Really? <laughs> Where did you get there's that, some, though? There's some poll we got to <laughs> <include> close <laughs> justice. I mean, there's <laughs> places where people are, but you've got to think how broad the state is yeah, and how many conservative areas there are. It, it ain't all in our I think that... Um, I think I, I appreciate that so many people are bringing up what it means to be an ally around this particular issue. Um, and I, I think I would uh, challenge us to think about what it means to be an ally to people who have invisible identities in general. Um, but there's a big difference between having an identity, a minority or marginalized identity that's visible to most people who come in contact with you, mm -hmm. as opposed to having an identity that you have to make the decision whether or not to disclose. Mm -hmm. um, we often rely upon people who are marginalized to fight their own fight, mm -hmm. in the assumption that if they were to bring it to the table, we're all good people. If they bring it up, of course we would support them. Um, and I think that we have to be very thoughtful around what we expect from people. Mm -hmm. Because the reality of living with a marginalized identity every day and struggling with it every day means that there are differential needs and differential traumas. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we need to be careful about how much we assume we can put on other people. Mm -hmm. So as allies, I think we need to consider what it means to create space. Mm -hmm. Sometimes creating space means creating gentleness in our minds when we see people of an identity and we mm -hmm. ask ourselves, why aren't you as militant as I am? Mm -hmm. I'm finding all this energy and all this time and all this passion to fight for you and you're not even willing to out yourself. Um, and I've seen that behavior a lot from allies and I just want to caution everyone to mm -hmm. really consider mm -hmm. about that. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. a lot of times we don't know that we're being abusive. Right, and I can understand the frustration. I you feel I can understand the frustration. I don't recognize that. So, so I want to just say something about being in the church uh, and not volunteering to be abused. Was yeah. that you? Yeah. But, but when you grow up in this myth, and then this myth, yeah. I mean, I grew up in the Church of God. I had no idea. I mean, I knew something was off. I just didn't know. What it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually didn't find out until about three years ago. Even though I've been moving away from it as, as an ordained clergy person in the United Church of Christ, it, who happens to be blessed to have the likes of Yvette Flunder as my as my personal mentor, but 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 it, because it hadn't been for her, and my son Oliver, I, I didn't know that I was being abused. I just didn't know because I never had anything to compare it with. I never I, I never saw a faith community love the marginalized. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a denomination that talked about loving. <laughs> you know, but I never saw it. <laughs> if, if that makes sense. I want to get Jim Toy in here a minute. Some of you know Jim Toy, some of you don't, but Jim was one of the first people to come out in Michigan as openly gay during an anti-war thing. He started the uh, first uh, Gay Lesbian Center at any university in the world, a number of other things. Um, and Jim, you've been so you've been part of the struggle practically from the beginning. Um, kind of any reflections you have about allies, religious community, where we are in the struggle right now? Thanks, Joe. I appreciate any help from any ally. And for those of you who are struggling. Uh, within your own community, which may not be 
supportive yeah. of us. I appreciate you uh, all the more. I think all the more, yeah, <laughs> because of the risks you are taking. Mm -hmm. And we just keep on keeping on. <laughs> <laughs> so we're told we have one minute left. I, I do want to say another little statistical thing out there. Right now, nationally, it's the religious allies who again and again have made the critical difference in national electoral uh, issues in terms of kind of religious allies with the secular community have been able to be more powerful than the conservative religious community. When legislation has been, progressive legislation has been passed or bad legislation has been defeated. So this all, this, you know, whether you want to be religious or not, this is, as France says, a key issue, whether you want to be demeaned in different ways or not. But there's a terribly important role uh, that we can play as religious allies in the public. So, so Deb and Joe, what's the action? So <laughs> what do you want us to do? So one action is we need to really tackle RIFRA. Yeah. Another thing is that I think we need to bring to interfaith and we need to bring into our churches whatever their stands are this talking about this human rights framework mm -hmm. and getting beyond this judging who gets to be respected and who doesn't get to be respected. Thank you. Thank you. Deb, something you want to add on that? No, that's, I mean, you know, there's some, um, you know, really good talking points, you know, that pe the, the U.S. network has put together that I'd be happy to send to Joe, just sort of like, you know, because it becomes very fuzzy, like, well, what is a human right? You know, where is it embodied, and what do I refer to? You know, what is, what does it really say? Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, there's like just a one-page great primer um, that I'll send to Joe, and he can send. So it if you will page. give put your email addresses on here, I will send it out to anybody who asks for it. Thank you. Uh, Thank Tom, you. Last, last yeah, word. just a little closing anecdote that, 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 that illustrates the importance that we communicate um, to the broader world. No offense, but the, the EO speakers are going to start in two minutes. We're negative three minutes, right? We're negative seven minutes.